Hey everyone, welcome to episode 22 of the Miami Tech Pod. I'm Cesar Fernandez and I am joined by the, the crew here, Will Weinrob, Maria Durchi, and Brian Breslin. And we have a great guest for, for everyone this week, John Oranger, the founder and uh, former CEO, current executive chairman of Shutterstock is with us. And of course, the uh, co-founder of Pareto Holdings, which is doing an amazing uh, job investing in, in founders and op- entrepreneurs here in Miami. John, welcome to the Miami Tech Pod. Thanks for having me. It's great to be here. Yeah, we are. Um, we're really excited to have you on. There's a ton of, of things for us to talk about. Uh, but first, why don't you kind of go through your story a little bit, uh, the early days of Shutterstock, um, and and start there so we can kind of orient the listeners as to your journey in entrepreneurship and building, you know, an absolute beast of a company that that Shutterstock is. Yeah. So it was. It all goes back to 1998. Um, I was building software products. They were Windows based uh, software products. That was the biggest platform at the time. Uh, if you wanted to build software and, and, and sell it, uh, Mac was smaller. Uh, and so privacy and security applications uh, uh, were the were the thing that people were paying paying for. Um, it was a problem that I realized uh, people I spoke to had. Um, it was kind of the beginning of, of, of some of the issues that uh, we still have today, right? I mean, what, what the, the, the product that I was selling the most was this thing called Pop-Up Eliminator, um, which was part of this surf secret suite. So it was, it was, it was all about preventing po- annoying pop-ups and letting you know which cookies were tracking you around the web. And so it's crazy actually to think that now, you know, more than 20 years later, we still deal with knowing who's tracking us when it comes to ads and, uh, and, and, and understanding how we can have some control over those ads uh, to make sure our data doesn't get away from us uh, in a weird way, which is, uh, which is crazy that we, we're still working on this today. Uh, there's, you know, there's a lot of companies out there today that are working on the same problems, but um, uh, uh, so those were, those were, that was the software product I was selling. I was selling that. I needed images to market that. Uh, I was creating some of them myself because the, the companies that were out there um, that still exist today, by the way, um, were kind of these, they, they were, they were, they were slow. The images were really expensive. Uh, they were, um, the licensing wasn't kept up to date. <clears throat> they were clearly um, good incumbents to target. Uh, so I started Shutterstock. I started a, a subscription service, the, the kind of service I would have wanted um, for what the internet was going to become a service where uh, you can log in at any time. You don't have to think about how much Im- each image costs. Um, you, you know, you subscribe, uh, you get what you need, and you get images that perform. You get some data around them. You understand what those images do and, and how, how they can uh, uh, promote your product. Um, so essentially what I was doing was I was creating these images to, to promote my software products. Um, it was a side project, and the side project became bigger than the main project. And the main project eventually got disrupted by Microsoft since Internet Explorer um, had those those features built in anyway. Um, so one day I just kind of woke up and I was looking at the numbers and just thinking, okay, well, I have these software companies that are kind of slow growing. and um, uh, uh, But this thing I just created on the side where I was charging like 50 bucks a month for this, uh, for my own really bad images was, was suddenly skyrocketing. I mean... I was looking at the LTV; it was really high. Um, the uh, you know there were there were customers. I was looking at the user list as it was coming in, as people were buying. I was watching the, watching it scroll by, and it was just crazy. Um, the network effect that was right there, right in front of me, that I was trying to build the software companies was suddenly in the side project. So I doubled down on the side project, and that became Shutterstock. That was two thousand three. Um, uh, and and continued to build that, and I'm still very involved with the company and. Uh, today it's a, it's an over $3 billion public company profitable every single quarter since 2003. Um, it's a good business. That's excellent. That's, um, you know, it, it's really amazing to, to not only hear that story and, and, and hear the growth, uh, but also, you know, we'd love to, to kind of get your, your take. I mean, since you're still involved and, and, you know, you're on the board and whatnot, like what, Talk to us about that transition, right? I would imagine it, it's actually like hard to build a billion-dollar company 
to absolutely watch it scale, to become a household name in, in, in the industry and then walk away from that. I'd love to, to get your thoughts um, on, on what, what drove that and um, any insights there. Yeah, sure. I mean, I'm, I'm still very involved and I'm still the largest shareholder. And so um, never, never really walked away, but the, 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 it's a dramatic change that, that I made and I made it in 2019 and it was actually many years in the making. Right. So, um, uh, yeah. So what happened was earlier on, um, I started to, I, I kind of got addicted to the next challenge always. Right. So it was like, all right, well, I can manage 10 employees. Can I imagine 25, manage 25? I mean, I'm just, I'm just an engineer that, you know, wears lots of hats. I can, uh, you know, this is, this is me in 2003. I can do marketing. I can, you know, take some photos. I could, you know, I, and, and I wasn't, I was trying not to be, um, uh, uh, I was trying to really understand what I was good at, what, what I wasn't, but I kind of got addicted to this next stage thing. So, you know, 25 employees, 50 employees, 100 employees, you know, 25 million in revenue, 50 million in, in, in ARR, 100 million in ARR, like these, the, the, each stage was getting um, more and more fun, right? And so I just kept going. You know, I didn't know how far I could go. Um, but every entrepreneur has their limit. Um, I got further than I thought, you know, right before the IPO, I was like, all right, should I hire a CEO? I don't know. I'm a startup guy. I know that down deep in my heart. Um, and, uh, and, and I just kind of went with it. Uh, and, and each stage, I mean, I was able to, I was able to do it, um, became public CEO, was able to do the quarterly calls. Um, it was around like 800 to a thousand employees where I started to get out of my, like, a little out of my comfort zone. Like I, I was, I was able to, um, I, I was able to manage the company. I kind of knew what we needed to do next. I was able to run the strategy. I was very involved in the product, but it was just, um, it was getting harder and harder. Obviously, I mean, you know, there, there, there are people that are career CEOs, and and I kind of deep down I wasn't that, but I didn't know where where the end was, right? And so, um, it was right around eight hundred to a thousand employees. I started to say, well, okay, well. You know, if this thing goes to 1,200 employees, I want someone else in the seat. So I started to think, you know, I started to bring in CEOs. I started to um, talk to career CEOs. I started to talk to people that were in uh, in digital media that could that, that could help. And I started to build my own succession plan. The board was, you know, supportive of this. And so it was like 2017 or so, 2018, that I started to... Uh, uh, sort of build, I, I knew I didn't want to do, be a public company doing a CEO search. Like, nobody wants to be that. Company right now. <laughs> right, right. So I wanted to be in the CEO search until I found the next CEO. So I, I started to, you know, I didn't know if it was going to be possible or not. It's very, it's a very hard transition, but um, I started to bring in, you know, people below me and build my own succession plan and work with the board and, and it worked. And uh, I mean, I probably, I mean, it was probably two years too late, but I was pretty close, right? I didn't, th I didn't, I, I wasn't sure in the beginning I was going to get a whole 18 years in. Um, I wasn't sure 16 was going to be it, but I was trying to target it. Um, sure. And and at at uh, turns out 16 was the right number. 18 was was when I was actually able to to transition. And the company's in a in stronger than ever position with our CEO Stan uh, uh, running it, and me as executive chairman spending about half my time on it right now. Uh, still as the largest shareholder, dealing with lots of the bigger. Uh, types of initiatives like capital allocation, M and A, and big strategic moves of where we go next. Uh, and the company is in, a, in, a, in an amazing position. It, that, that's you know, it, it sounds. Uh, I, I may. Uh, it was actually a very difficult transition. I, I, I maybe, hopefully I came through that, but uh, uh, it was difficult to kind of let go of your your baby. To letting go was not difficult because um, I've never. <laughs> let go, I'm still very involved, but um. It, what, letting go of the CEO position was, was easy because I knew it was, it was the right time, but finding the right person when you're a public company to hand uh, the thing you created uh, to on a day-to-day -day basis is, is actually a really difficult thing. Um, it's hard to find that person. And, uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm glad we did. I knew we would. It just, it uh, took a couple of years, which I think is pretty normal. Yeah. Sounds good. So, you know, we are the Miami Tech Pod. So question on everyone's mind, our listeners, I'm sure, it are what brought you to Miami? So COVID happened uh, the same exact time, coincidentally, that I transitioned to executive chairman. 
Um, I knew I wanted to get back to the startup scene. I knew I wanted to start a lot of companies. I knew I wanted to not be CEO and operate again. I wanted to be executive chairman of a lot of things. Uh, and so, and I, and I didn't want to just be a, an investor. Like anyone can, you know, uh, you know, tra- make this transition and just start, you know, throwing money into different ideas. I wanted to be, I, I know I can do more than that. Um, and I knew I wanted to be part of an upward and coming tech scene because that, that, you know, New York in 2003 was super exciting. I love the idea that, you know, other people, I thrive in environments where other people are betting against uh, me or, or, or the thing we're, we're, we're all building together. And, you know, there's a little bit of that in like these new tech scenes. I love that, you know, where, where people are like, you're not going to find the talent you're going to, you know, you, 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 you need certain types of universities. Like, I think that's all bullshit. And, you know, even in, even in New York, like, you know, people said that back in 2003, like every company that was a tech company was moving to San Francisco and I want to stay in New York. So I stayed in New York. Um, and so I was looking for something, something new here. And I, and I, I like that early uh, environment and Miami has that and it's really fun. So uh, I, I feel like Miami's like New York in 2003. And so, you know, if, 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 if we're right about that, 20 years from now, we're going to have several multi- tens of billions of dollars of value uh actually it may even be you know more than a lot more than that um uh of, of public company kind of startups that that, that happen now so uh, keeping on this thread of like miami like what's been the most sort of uh surprising thing to you in the however many months you've been here yeah so moved to miami in october um i spent a lot of time in miami I used to have a place that, uh, uh, in South of fifth, uh, now we're mid beach, but, um, I know the area really well. And so I, I think I knew, I, I mean, I, I'm not surprised that there's a taxi and I knew, I knew that was going to happen. Um, but right when I moved, uh, it was, it was literally that week. I think the how can I help tweet, uh, from the mayor came out. I think, just the amount of support from local government is something that was pretty surprising to me Um, to have a mayor that's pro business, that's um, supportive of, of, of job creation that wants to attract business instead of chasing business away. Um, I think I was just so pleasantly surprised by that, that um, I not only knew I made the right decision, but decided to like triple down on what we were doing. I mean, we, we were, we were like, let's, you know, we're now investing in two companies a week and uh, we're helping pre-seed several of them. Um, a lot of them are, you know, some of them we can even call incubations because we're pretty involved in them. Uh, and uh, it's just gotten more and more exciting. So it made me want to just uh, uh, really, really triple down. And I think, you know, it, this is really a model for other mayors who, and, and everybody should be watching what Mayor Suarez is doing on Twitter and social media and how he's promoting the city and how important that is. Because there haven't, I, I mean, I, I haven't seen that in a while. Uh, and having that kind of support uh, is so important. Uh, and so I think, you know, maybe, 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 you know, Miami can do this you know even faster than, than New York and San Francisco did it. Uh, because of that. So you're also in like the rare uh, situation where you have four Miami natives like with you, so to speak. So are there any things that you're like curious about uh, with regards to Miami or like um, you want some native advice on? Yeah, I guess. I mean, I don't have all the history, but how do we get more people uh, to graduate from universities and stay and create businesses? Uh, because I think, and I, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't here the day to day, you know, past, you know, the, the, this past year. Um, but I've, uh, the, the perception is that it was like, a uh, Miami has been a net exporter of engineering talent and tech talent. Uh, and so how do we change that? Yeah, I'll jump in. Uh, and Brian would love to hear your thoughts on this and everybody else's thoughts on this. I mean, I think what happened from a brain drain perspective over the past decade, all the reasons that that happened no longer exist. So you had folks that uh, you know were here, they were involved in tech, they were you know, software engineers, they wanted to start companies. A decade ago, 
you would have validity by making the claim that this is infertile ground for you. I mean, just as recently as five, six years ago, I had a company called Live Ninja, which we sold in 2017. Like we were left in Silicon in the Silicon Valley and in New York. Like folks said, Miami, you just you got to move the company out. There's no way you're going to attract the engineers. There's no way you know the VC capital is there. Uh, we never have to hear those things ever again. Like there's just not going to be in anybody's vernacular that you can't build it in Miami. The money's here. The talent's here. The talent's being imported into Miami rather than being exported. Uh, you know, Brian shared on a previous uh, podcast. It was hilarious because we used to always go to San Francisco to raise money. Now San Francisco's coming here to raise money, right. which is the twilight zone, you know? Um, so again, I do not, I, all the, the reasons that we had brain drain before, I just do not see uh, holding much, much, uh, much weight these days. We do have to get better, uh, you know, from an institutional education standpoint, having, you know, universities and things like that, double down on software engineering and entrepreneurship, things like that are already in the works. You saw with like what Knight Foundation's doing, they, they just, you know, made a $15 million grant to the University of Miami and other institutions. Um, but things are getting better. But I do think at a high level, all the reasons our talent left no longer exist. We'd love to hear everybody else's thoughts on that. So as the sole employee of a higher education institution on this call, uh, on this podcast, so I can talk to a bunch of these points. So historically, like FIU, which is the biggest public university south of Orlando, um, historically, like 60% of their uh, CS and STEM grads would leave town. Uh, and a lot of them were getting recruited out by Microsoft and IBM because Microsoft and IBM were donating money to those programs, you know, in order to like uh, make sure that everyone coming out of there knew C Sharp and or Java and or, you know, whatever Microsoft IDE was, you know, in flavor or whatever at the time. Um, I think the other challenge for a lot of those graduates was like, they saw recruiters from these companies coming there, like physically coming to the campus and no one else was coming to the campus, right? So these companies had the sort of the pick of the litter, you know, and FIU has, I think the fourth largest computer science department in the country, you know, and then UM is a little substantially smaller, but still, you know, a few hundred grads a year too. Um, I think, so those two cohorts of, of students were instantly being siphoned out by the opportunistic big corps that like, had the money to send recruiters down here. I think the, the there's a dynamic we've seen though, which is shifting to talk to Will's point is like a year ago, my students at UM, all of them said they were not staying in Miami after graduation. And now all of like, I'd say two thirds of them are super excited about staying in Miami because they hear the sort of the, the talk about all these different opportunities that are here, right? And they're not in the same loop as us. They're not the ones reading TechCrunch or Refresh by Me News or, you know, things like that. They're like, they hear about these opportunities from, you know, their friends, you know, and we have to make it a point that we, we either get companies to like come on campus and host job fairs. We also need to get um, recruiters, you know, to realize that like, look, you know, you can also work with the universities to build out curriculum. Like we have a program that we're working on that hasn't been announced yet with a large institutional partner to build out a training course for people to operate startups, you know, and so that's gonna be rolling out in the fall. And that's across the three main uh, universities and colleges here in Miami. And so, um, like I'm not spoiling it because I haven't said the name of the company we're working with or the the fund we're working with, but um, it'll produce you know seventy to eighty graduates a year that are trained in the the levels or the type of operating experiences and skills that they that startups are looking for, you know. Um, but that's still a drop in the bucket. I think there's five thousand plus jobs that have been announced coming to Miami, right? And so we're gonna have to all do our part to let people across the country know, especially the, you know, the Miami natives who left, um, let them know that there's opportunities back, back home, you know, where they can be closer to home and stuff. I think another factor at play here, and I have no data to back this up, but a lot of locals in Miami are first generation here, their family sacrificed everything to get here. So I feel like there was a certain level of pressure to go with the safer bets, the Microsoft's, uh, the you know the big companies out in other cities and so versus so kind of 
going to a startup, which is risky, but I think that's shifting because now these families are seeing how much wealth can be generated by going to work early on in a startup. So I think a lot of these factors are coming into play. Um, the fact that, you know, those companies were giving pretty hefty salaries, even though the, qual the cost of life might be more uh, in these other cities. I think now Miami companies are starting to kind of increase their pay. Uh, but I think definitely the the pressure, familiar pressure was playing into that to a certain extent. And hopefully now we're kind of changing that narrative. So I want to take this opportunity to transition. John, you mentioned uh, tripling down on Miami, which I love. Uh, and a, a big part of that is what you're doing with uh, Pareto, right? And the fellowship and, and all that work. I just keep hearing about it left and right that, you know, Pareto's involved with this and we're working with Pareto and we're, we were talking about this company and they're making investments. So like you really in a, in a rather short period of time have, you know, backed up all these statements that you've had about Miami, kind of put your money where your mouth is and are really planting flags here and helping entrepreneurs take that leap. Uh, would love uh, for the listeners to hear from you on what is Pareto? How did it evolve? And what's your vision for it moving forward? Not just the, uh, the fellowship, but overall, you know, all the stuff you're working on through Pareto Holdings. The iteration that I went through earlier uh, with my initial companies kind of leading me to Shutterstock, um, that's the true entrepreneurial journey. It's, you know, it, it's, it's, it's kind of rare that someone wakes up with an idea as their first idea, um, you know, and, 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 you know, they, they work on it and, you know, they raise money. It's an overnight success. And, and they, usually the, the entrepreneurial journey um, involves a lot of iteration, a lot of painful failures, a lot of, um, a lot of uh, uh, letting go of an idea to, to make some really, really uh, hard pivots. Uh, and uh, I, I just, I've been through that now, uh, the 10 startups, you know, that failed before Shutterstock. Um, I've been through that at Shutterstock as we've built the company. And uh, th that's kind of the, 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 the kernel of Pareto, right? That you should spend 80% of your time on the 20% of things uh, that work, but you don't always know beforehand which 20% are gonna work and which aren't. So a lot of irons in the fire, a lot of really smart people, and a lot of people that are willing uh, to go through uh, some serious change in order to understand uh, and take over one of those uh, irons in the fire that uh, suddenly uh, has, has, has gotten some momentum. Uh, and so that is Pareto. And that's why we called it Pareto. And we, we, we want founders that are able to, to, to kind of pivot through these changes and, and we're finding them, we're finding them in Miami. We're finding them uh, in other places. We're finding people that want to move to Miami. So it's been it's been great. Um, so Preto is a, is a is a holding company that makes investments all the way up to um, actual hands on incubations. Uh, and you know if we if we find companies to to invest in, we like to be early. We like to help in that at an er, that initial early stage. Uh, we do that uh, very often. Um, and if there's an idea we have. Uh, and the the uh, the business doesn't exist. We'll find an operator and we'll match them with the idea, and we'll help them launch it. And that becomes one of our incubations uh, or a pre seed, depending on where it is, uh, it, 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 how it fits. Uh, all of these things are are kind of uh, individual uh, uh, journeys, and uh, but they follow the same kind of pattern where you just have to be open to this change and. Uh, we're, we're finding that it's a successful model and uh, we're able to do it. So Ed Lando is my, my partner in this and we're going to uh, continue and we've only been accelerating, which is kind of exciting. So I love the idea of basically your batch creating 17 almost new startups through this fellowship thing, right? Like walk me through the thesis, like, oh, so what, like what's the, like, why would an entrepreneur choose to, to do this, you know, like what's the, how, what does the value proposition look like for them? Yeah, there's lots of different styles of these, um, these the, of the model that, that, that I explained, but I do think we have a unique uh, take on it, right? So there's the Y Combinator model where 
uh, you can, you, you know, you can sell them 7% of your company and uh, they have courses and they have a network. Um, and uh, it's been going on for a long time and it's, it's, it's kind of a template. Uh, and I, I think that's a great model as well, but we didn't want to be that hands off. So we want to do a smaller number of those um, uh, than they do. There, there's like the Y Combinator model, and then there's there's a whole spectrum all the way to kind of operating a single company and driving forward. And so we we, we want a predator to be somewhere in the middle there, where we're able to um, be really flexible. It's we're not raising any money; it's only our own money that we're investing. It's uh, so that, so that gives us a lot of control over over how we invest and what we invest in. We don't have to fulfill any external mandates, um, which makes it. Uh, I think unique right there, right? So an incubator model also will often have external investors that, you know, want to see certain types of businesses or, or um, invest in um, certain sectors or um, have a say over some of the investment. We don't, we don't have that. It's, it's, it's only, it's only our money. So it's super lean that way. Um, we're able to do the entire spectrum. So if, if we do need to get hands on and the founder wants us to be hands on, we often take a bigger stake for that. Um, we're also okay taking a smaller stake uh, and being um, less hands-on and helping with fundraising and high-level strategy uh, and, and those types of things. Um, obviously, you know the, the limiting factors here are time and cash. Uh, it's easier out there to find cash, but we've been able to scale our time pretty well because of the. Uh, uh, pattern I described earlier, where entrepreneurship, you know, we, I, I think we, I think we have hit on that, uh, that recipe, uh, and and our founders have found that uh, it, it is it is a value add. So it's not for everyone. Um, there are people that uh, we've met that that have gone with with other types of um, uh, models, but we don't call ourselves an incubator. We don't call ourselves a VC firm. Uh, we're literally a holding company that 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 will make you more successful, uh, and we can tailor uh, the the exact type of involvement uh, for each specific situation. If that makes sense. Yeah, John, I, I'd love to um, get your take on something that's been kind of in the news lately. There's been a lot of talk around um, you know some of these employee p petitions that are circulating around large uh, companies like Apple and others. And I think you may have dealt with this uh, at Shutterstock at one point. But I ask this because there's a lot of CEOs that are listening to, to this podcast that are building companies here in Miami that eventually have the ambition to manage hundreds and thousands of people like you have. Um, when you're in that seat and your employees kind of feel really, really strongly about a particular position of the company that has taken either from a product perspective or from some type of, you know, political stance that they may have have weighed in on or some type of like actual, you know, regulatory issue they're facing. Like how, how do you strike that balance of like trying to make the, the companies uh, really pr protect the company's um, positions and interests, but also, you know, have their your employees backs right i think that's like one of the harder things we've seen ceos deal with lately and love to get your take on that yeah i think it's like it's always difficult being a, a running a, a business you're never going to make everybody happy um and you need to make the decisions you need to make at the time to be the most successful you know you're going to make mistakes you're going to uh, make decisions that uh uh you need to make um, and companies ha are, are pretty resilient uh, to change. Uh, and I think, uh, I think they have to be open to making hard decisions and be open to making uh, uh, these, these uh, uh, changes throughout their businesses. We've, we've had just as many uh, tough decisions to make at Shutterstock as others. I'm sure we'll have them in Pareto as well. Uh, and we're going to continue to uh, uh, navigate through them. Um, there isn't a company out there that hasn't had that. That being said, uh, the past few years have been a big change. Uh, employees are more vocal. Uh, there's, um, there's a lot of different channels. Uh, you're, you're kind of uh, managing a company today is different than managing a company 10 years ago. There's, there's just different uh, communication mechanisms and channels that, that employees will go through. 
um, everywhere from, you know, your glass door profile to, um, to some, you know, there could be an, uh, a mini activist group inside of your, inside of your company. These are all normal things. Every company has one. Um, and every company navigates through it. Uh, yeah, it's, it, it's not easy, but you have to do, I think at the end of the day, what's best for the business, uh, and, and move forward. Um, you see companies like Coinbase saying, you know, they're, they're mission driven and that's the only thing, uh, they'll, they'll, they'll focus on and, you know, they they ignore everything else around them, including politics. Um, and then you see, uh, businesses that are, 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 you know, take actual political stands, uh, you know, across the spectrum, there's different types of ways businesses are dealing with this. Um, I don't think there's, there's, there's no one answer, but I, I think there's success in, in a lot of these different, uh, ways that businesses are dealing with it. You know, that's an interesting point you made at the end. You know, I think uh, like my wife and I have talked about this a lot. She works at a big corporation down here that owns Burger King, you know, and um, how a company treats sort of the politics of people's lives has changed so much, you know, because if you think about it, people like if you assume that the person's entire life is the work and they're expected to work 70, 80, 90, 100 hours or whatever it is, then they need outlets for these types of uh, conversations, right? And so to assume that those other parts of people's lives don't exist when you're expecting 100% of their commitment to, to you, it's a, it's, it's a very slippery slope to, to navigate, or a thin, it's tough to na navigate that, right? Whereas like in the past people had, whether it was church or community or neighborhoods or whatever, you know, to like v sort of express those feelings and stuff, you know, I, like, I don't know if there is good advice for anybody with, you know, navigating that because it's so sort of uh, case dependent. Right. But it's definitely something worth people thinking about as they go and they start scaling a business, because if you scale a business, you have to assume, you know, that these are real people that are working for you and they're going to have opinions and, you know, and opinions on what the workplace is like. Yeah. And I think look, there's so much change going on around us that, um, but, you know, well, each company is going to get to their, their, uh, their right, uh, spot on this. I don't think there's one answer. I think, um, I think, you know, each business has to navigate it on their own, depending on what their, what their product or service is and, uh, and they will, um, you know, I, we're probably going through the biggest disruption in any of our lives, you know, the past mm -hmm. couple of years and um, with that comes, comes change. And I, I think, I think, yeah, you know, change is going to be the only, um, the, the only thing we can, we can rely on at this point. So I think we just have to navigate it uh, as we go and, and get to a good place for all of our businesses. Absolutely. Sorry. Awesome. I don't know. Less, uh, no, you're yeah. good. John, thanks for, for your time here. Anything else before we wrap that you'd like to share with, with our listeners? Um, how can they get a hold of you? I know you're, uh, you're on social media and all of that. Why don't you, uh, take it, take it from there and then we'll wrap. Yeah, sure. You can find me on Twitter, just John Oranger, no H J O N O R I N G E R. Um, LinkedIn, Instagram, uh, we're running the Preto fellowship this week and, uh, We've had 600 applicants. We chose 17 finalists and we're Man. getting some good businesses uh, out of this, I think. So, you know, we plan to do this again at some point. So all of, all of your listeners should, uh, if, if anyone's interested to, to apply to our next one, I'd encourage them to. Um, and yeah, be great to see you all in Miami again soon. Awesome. Well, John, thank you so much for joining us. This was episode 22 of the Miami Tech Pod. And uh, if, you're, if you're listening at home or watching on, on YouTube, please make sure to subscribe to the pod. Uh, tell your friends and family about it. We're uh, growing like crazy and have some exciting guests for you in the, in the pipeline here. So we'll see you next week. Take care.